Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, in particular with air conditioning uh, working again. So, okay, it'll be my job to prevent you from falling into a lunch coma um, <laughs> after the, the big lunch we just had. Okay, so the topic of this series of lectures is going to be gravitational waves. Um, that's a really hot topic at the moment. Um, due to, okay, as for sure you've all, you've all heard, the detection of, uh, of first detection of gravitational waves by LIGO uh, two years ago, pretty much exactly 100 years after they were predicted by, by Einstein, um, and then also the, the Nobel Prize uh, last year. But it, it, like it's hot, a hot topic right now, but it's been really interesting already before that, uh, because gravitational waves are really a completely new messenger that we're dealing with now. And because before, we were doing all sorts of astronomy, for example, but it was all photons, right? I mean, it was x-rays, it was uh, infrared, uh, it was gamma ray bursts, but this is all photons. Now we have a completely new messenger, and that's a completely new window to test, to test physics in general, obviously to test general relativity. There's no free parameters that is associated with this new particle, right? It's all completely predicted by GR. Um, and also to probe cosmology. Because gravitational waves have the interesting property that because they are so weakly coupled, they can propagate through the universe at times where the photons cannot. Okay? So very early in the universe, the universe is very hot, very dense, lots of charged particles, and the photons couldn't propagate. So everything that we can learn from photons essentially stops at the, at the CMB. We cannot see behind that, that wall because the universe is simply not see-through. So if we want to learn anything about the very early universe, or equivalently about very, very high uh, energy scales, gravitational waves are really the only way to go. I mean, neutrinos could bring us somewhere, but I mean, we haven't detected a cosmic neutrino background yet either, so let's, let's start with the one that we know. And in principle, gravitational waves interact so weakly that in principle you could measure today the gravitational waves emitted during cosmic inflation, so really at, at the Big Bang. So that, that's kind of the holy grail, uh, at least for a cosmologist uh, as me. Um, Astrophysicists might say something else about holy grails, but... Um, so the plan, the plan for these lectures is going to be um, ah, so the upper, there's an upper and a lower limit here. Okay. So today we'll talk about uh, free gravitational wave propagation. So that's essentially, okay, what is a gravitational wave in the first place? What are its properties? Uh, and how does it propagate once it has been created all the way into loss? So that's essentially 99% of the lifetime of a gravitational wave. Uh, tomorrow be about emission of gravitational waves. Okay, so that will be a first look at uh, different sources and how in general uh, what properties of the metric we need or what properties of the source we need in order to emit gravitational waves. And hopefully, we'll also be able to, at some point here, let's see how it goes, uh, briefly talk about experiments. So since I'm a theorist, this is going to be a very theorist approach to how, what an experiment is. Um, and I, I can't say these things when experimentalists are around too much, have to be careful. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and give you an overview of, of how my understanding of this. Um, OK, then we'll talk about an application of, of all of this, which is now the standard example, binary systems. So that covers, for example, the black hole, black hole merger and the neutron, neutron star merger as detected by LIGO. Um, and then in the last lecture, uh, we come to cosmological sources. And in particular, the stochastic gravitational wave background, which is essentially the gravitational wave analogy of the CMB. Uh, and you will see that this is a completely different type of source than, than what this is. Okay, so essentially, what we are since, since two years ago is we have measured a first example of this. There's still a lot more out there that we can learn about. And this is essentially going to be, this is the thing we haven't seen yet, but what we hope to see, uh, well, hopefully in a few years or so from now. And okay, I mean, if you have any questions at any point, I mean, don't hesitate to, to stop me, uh, ask questions, uh, tell me if I'm too slow, if I'm, or if I'm too fast, if you know everything. Ah, and so mainly 
So in particular, for the first two lectures, uh, I'll mainly be following the textbook by Majora. So he has uh, two books uh, and uh, one, one review, which is on the archive. The review is from 99 or 98. It's called gravitational waves or something very obvious. I can give you the, the number tomorrow. OK, first blackboard is full. <laughs> so the basic of gravitational waves are Einstein's equations. OK, so we have the Ricci tensor. The Ricci scalar, this is the, the metric when the in indices are downstairs, it's the regular metric. When the indices are upstairs, it's the inverse metric. Uh, and on the right hand side, I will make an attempt to take the C factors with me. I will lose them eventually. Um, this is Newton's constant. And we have the, the energy momentum tensor. So what this equation is essentially telling you, these are objects which are constructed um, from the metric. So this side is essentially gravity. And this side is, well, whatever matter you have, whatever you have that sources your energy momentum tensor. Okay, so what Einstein's equation tells you is how gravity and matter talk to each other. Okay, so how matter curves gravity and how gravity acts on matter. So I'm going to assume that you've at least seen this equation uh, at some point in your life. Um, Ah, excellent. We're going to do minus plus plus plus. So mostly plus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can take a vote from it, but I'm not going to change the notes. <laughs> um, well, then we're going to do that because Majora does it. OK, so let me just uh, briefly remind you what, what these objects are. Um, it's actually going to, very quickly, w things are going to simplify dramatically, okay? So very quickly, we won't have to deal with all the indices of, of GR. But just to have it correct once, so we have the Christoffel symbols. Just the derivatives of the metric. And from the, and these guys are of course zero if we have a flat metric, right? Because then just the derivatives vanish. Um, and from the Christoffel symbols, we construct the Riemann curvature tensor. Sorry, could you talk about the a little bit? Yes. Okay, so let me read them once, and then I'll write bigger. Uh, mu nu sigma, oh, mu mu, is that correct? Yeah, mu mu sigma, no. <laughs> ah! I was going to happen, but did it have to happen in the first equ equation? <laughs> it must be, this must be a new, I guess. <laughs> was that a friendly way of telling me that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so new mu sigma, sigma mu nu. Ah. Uh, and this is an alpha. Is that any better? Yeah. I was just checking if you're paying attention, of course. OK, so we essentially we have, we have the two derivative terms. We're here the, the diff okay, we have two derivative terms and then two terms which are quadratic in the Christoffel symbols. And the difference between the, these two terms and these two terms is just that the, the alpha and beta indices are swapped around. OK, and then finally, the objects in here, the ones we actually wanted. Um, are just the contraction of the Riemann tensor with the first and third index, and then the full contraction like this. 
Okay. So the, the most important message from, from this is that, okay, the entire left hand, so once you know the metric, you need to go to, to some index algebra and you get the left hand side of this equation. So now, uh, what we want to do, um, this so far is, is just GR, right? This has nothing to do with gravitational wave yet. So how do we get a gravitational wave yet? So what we're going to do, is we're going to expand our metric as eta mu nu, where eta mu nu denotes for me the flat background metric. Yeah? So this is really the object, which is minus plus plus plus. Um, plus some small perturbation, where the small perturbation is allowed to depend on space and also on uh, space and time in general. Okay, and we're always we're always going to work in the limit where this guy is very very small, and that's very justified because, for example, uh, the event that that LIGO detected, right? I mean the the crash of or the merger of two. Uh, two black holes with 30 solar masses each, so ginormous event uh, in, in cosmic history. When we detected it on Earth, the amplitude of this guy uh, relative to this guy was 10 to the minus 21. Okay, so it's a, it's a very good approximation to say that this thing is much smaller than one. If this thing is ever bigger than one or comparable to one, then you're not worrying about gravitational waves anymore. I mean, you're not worrying at all anymore, right? Because it means you're essentially close to the horizon of a black hole or something like that. So for all practical purposes, first order is essentially, well, nearly always enough except for tomorrow. Um, okay, so we can then just plug this into these equations, right? So we start with this guy. Uh, we expand to, to first order. Uh, the zeroth order we already said is zero, okay? If you just plug in the flat metric, it gives nothing. So we can directly go to the first order term. Ah, now we can check my indices. Yeah, it was correct. It's correct now. Okay. So this is now the background metric. And once we have this, uh, we can do construct this object here. Okay, the goal is to construct the entire left hand side. But if you look at this object, okay, you see, okay, here it's simply we just take the derivative of the object that we just wrote down, this term and this term. But here, these objects, uh, they are quadratic in, in the gamma, but the gamma we, we saw has no zeroth order in H, right? So you cannot get anything first order in H from this term. And these, these terms will only give things at higher order. So we can completely forget about them for now. All we need to do is, is consider these two terms. So So this is just this expression in the first term on that blackboard. Okay, and then the second term, this term, uh, sorry, this term, this term you can get from this term by just switching the indices uh, alpha and beta. Okay, so we'll get the exact same term again uh, with alpha and beta interchanged, and that's it. Yeah, because the, the quadratic terms in gamma don't contribute. And now you see we have one term here, which is this one, which is symmetric in alpha and beta. Uh, important, minus. Uh, and because it's, you can just switch derivatives, so once you add this term over here, 
uh, this guy vanishes. Okay, so there's only three terms, uh, uh, sorry, only two terms left in the, in the Riemann tensor. Plus, of course, again, something which is of order h squared. Okay, and now we could continue, do the other contractions to get uh, these objects here. Um, I'm going to take a shortcut and introduce, because it will be useful in a minute, Mm. Where do I put it? I put it here. So I'm going to introduce an object h bar, which is defined where this little h is the trace. Okay, this is just h uh, alpha alpha. Okay, so I'm I'm subtracting the trace times a specific coefficient, um, which is very similar to the object that, we, that is here living on the left-hand side of Einstein's equation, just from the structure. And the reason for doing it is simply because the equations become very simple uh, when you introduce this object. So in terms of this object, we can then write the left-hand side here, which we call g mu nu, the entire left-hand side. There's a del sigma del sigma, which is just the box operator. So it's not, it's not, um, yeah, so this is, this is, I mean, you need to do a couple of lines of computation to get from here to here. Yeah, but that, I'm going to spare you the indices. But it's, it's very straightforward. I am a bit sloppy about writing the indices upstairs and downstairs. Okay, and these are all the h-bar objects. Okay, so this is not as bad as it could have been. Okay, we only have four terms left. Uh, but it's still four terms, yeah, and it's, it still has a lot of indices. <laughs> So now, now we need to uh, talk about something which essentially uh, uh, Gia this morning covered half my lecture because uh, we need to talk about gauge transformations. Yeah, because here with this h mu nu object, in principle because it's a symmetric 4 by 4 tensor, it has 10 degrees of freedom. Yeah, but we actually don't have 10 propagating degrees of freedom uh, in gravity. Okay, so we need to check what are the actual physical degrees of freedom we want to talk about. Um, and what are only gauge degrees of freedom, and then we want to focus only on the physical degrees of freedom, which will make our life a lot easier. So this h bar is now traceless? Or? No, it's not. No, it's uh, you would think it's traceless, but it's not um, because you you compute this. Uh, and you get, because uh, you would with, with, with the proper metric, uh, and you get, I think you get that the trace of h bar is uh, minus one or minus two, something like that. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 trace, the trace of h bar is minus h. So if you do. Yeah, I mean, you, you do what, what in order to check this, what you do, like it, it looks nearly traceless, but it's not, right? So if you, if you multiply from the left by a, an atom you knew, yeah, and you then, okay, you just contract here, um, so that gives you h, uh, but then you, you, con you just contract the two, e the two eters, right, and that gives you uh, two, four, four, that gives you four, that's the point, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, and then you see it's not traceless. So it looks like it could be traceable, but it's not. It's, it's going to be, what it is going to be, it's going to be divergence-free in the end. 
but you can't see that from there yet. Okay, so because we're talking about GR, um, the symmetry transformation that we have to worry about, or the gauge transformation that we have to worry about, is just general coordinate transformations, right? So if we do a transformation, let's say x prime mu is x mu plus some parameter xi mu, which in general can also depend on space and time, uh, we need to understand how does the object that we constructed there depend on the this transformation, okay? Because we can always just choose a different coordinate frame and the physics, uh, everything would look different, but the physics has to be the same. So, in other words, under this coordinate transformation, uh, what will happen is that uh, g mu nu uh, will go over in some uh, g mu nu prime, which we can then again expand as eta mu nu eta mu nu plus h prime mu nu. Okay, but the question is what is h prime mu nu? So we need to understand how, how these objects transform. Okay, but that's a simple exercise. So I'm working with the inverse metric now um, for no really good reason, okay? You could also do it with the indices downstairs. It's the exact same computation. So g prime of mu nu, yeah, you can just obtain with this uh, transformation by just essentially writing the Jacobian dx prime mu over dx lambda. Sorry. Yes. Um, if you're working with the inverse, shouldn't it be a minus? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. It should. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you get the, with the normal you get the plus and then you, exp you tailor expand the inverse and you get the minus. Correct. Um, these are really probably too small, right? So this is a mu, this is a lambda. Um, and the same for the second index, so dx prime nu over dx rho, and then contracted with g rho lambda rho. Okay, writing, reading, and talking at the same time. Um, okay, so uh, what is that? Okay, so from here, okay, there's one, you just take the derivative of, of the first guy, you just uh, get back your original metric. Uh, and then you go to, I mean, we're, we're considering, sort of said, we're considering a small and infinitesimal transformation like psi. Okay, so both psi and h are small now. Okay, so now we go to first order in psi, uh, and we take these two derivatives. So if we go zero order here and first order there, we have a delta mu lambda del rho psi nu g lambda rho and then we do it the other way around and we get the delta lambda psi nu delta nu rho g lambda rho plus something which is psi squared. Uh, now we can write this object as eta mu nu minus h mu nu. And here we can just uh, uh, contract the indices, right? So the, the lambda with this delta will turn into a mu, and this rho will turn into a nu. So in total, yep, what you get is del mu psi nu plus del nu psi mu plus things which are uh, either higher order in h or higher order in psi. 
OK, but now, of course, by just comparing this line with this line, uh, we've identified what h prime is. So the transformation law that we were looking for is that h, uh, well, let's write, do the upstairs one first, h menu goes over in h menu prime, which is h menu plus del mu psi nu, oh, sorry, minus opposite sign here, minus del nu psi mu. Okay, so to take a step back, what this tells us is we can do some coordinate transformation, which we know is a symmetry of GR, we know the physics is the same, and under this coordinate transformation, the gravitational, what the, what the perturbation of the metric, which in the, at the end of the day is going to turn out to be the gravitational wave, uh, transforms into this object here, so it tra transforms by this quantity here, but we know this describes the same physics. Okay, so this transformation here is a pure gauge transformation. Uh, this object here, this H prime object and this H object uh, have to describe the same physics. So what we want to essentially do is to find a clever choice of this psi parameter to gauge fix uh, the degrees of freedom. And do we need, okay. So, and just, okay, and if you write the, the there's an equivalent equation where the indices are downstairs. Uh, and yeah, you just lower the indices so the minus signs here stay unchanged. So. Okay, so now here we've seen how uh, H menu transforms. Uh, we will also want to know how H menu bar transforms, okay? Because H menu bar was the object in which we used to write this in a convenient way. Um, but I mean, you can just, just insert this definition here, here, um, and you find okay, that H prime mu nu Okay, so this is just the, the first part, the h menu part from over there is of course exactly the same. And now we have to take the trace, okay? So we have one half eta mu nu, and then the trace, uh, the trace of h with this, trans with this transformation. So you've seen that I've already written a bar over here. This takes into account this trace object acting on this guy, so all we need is the trace object acting on the second term. Uh, so that's just trace del nu psi, del mu psi nu, and the other way around. Uh, which, if you contract it, is of course just 2 del mu psi mu. Okay. So why do we do this? We now do something uh, which is completely equivalent to what we do in, le in electrodynamics. Okay, we look at the derivative term, the divergence. So del nu h bar prime mu nu. Um, and again, you'll see why we do this in a second. So you just uh, compute it here. So del nu h mu nu bar minus del nu del mu psi nu uh, so with this guy, now this guy, minus del nu del mu psi nu minus del nu del nu psi mu plus last term eta mu nu del nu del mu psi mu. And now, this term and this term, wait, ah, 
my indices are wrong again. This is a new. OK, now this term and this term exactly cancel. OK, so what we obtain is that this is just the divergence of h bar minus the box operator of psi mu. And this is now something that should look familiar. Yeah, it should look familiar from this morning. Because this is precisely uh, what one does in, in electrodynamics. OK, so let me quickly do the, uh, show you. This is essentially what Gia did this morning. So I've been avoiding A's all the time, so that now I can use A's, right? So this morning we had that the theory should be invariant under A mu goes to A mu plus del mu uh, was called alpha. And then one way of doing the gauge fixing is to say del mu uh, A mu is 0, which fixes the gauge. And this is exactly the same thing that we're looking at here, right? And then that fixes the gauge up to an object which satisfies box alpha 0, right? And it's the exact same story here, because now we looked at the divergence. We found this relation here. So we say, OK, now what we're going to do is we're going to choose psi in such a way that we can impose um, that the new object is 0. Yeah, this is essentially, this is Lorentz gauge. It's exactly the same Lorentz gauge. Uh, as over here. And you can always, due to this transformation property, you can always find a psi, uh, which removes, uh, which you can always choose a psi such that this equation holds. And then in a moment, we'll have to deal with the residual freedom, which we still have, because we can still do transformations which satisfy uh, box psi equals 0. But already at this point, yes, it's still here, with this condition, we can go into this equation. Um, and you see, we have a lot of divergences here. OK? OK, this is just a box operator. But this is a divergence. Uh, this is a divergence. This is a divergence. So can I really not write down here? <laughs> so in Lorentz gauge, this complicated object is really only this. It's only uh, the box operator. The entire left-hand side of the Einstein equation is just uh, the box operator. It's just really the, the free wave equation. Questions? Yes? So uh, the third term on the right-hand side, uh, when you first write the new Yes, this term. That one? Uh, the one on the left. That one? Yeah. So that uh, hasn't been cancelled by anything yet, right? So it should still carry on. I think you wrote the same term twice accidentally. Yeah. Okay. So there should be. Okay. So this guy is this guy. This guy is this guy, right? This guy is this guy. No. Mm -hmm. You wrote the same term. Oh. Oh, this guy is this guy. Sorry. And we're just saying the derivative, right? Just the same amount of terms. Yes, thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the mu and the new are downstairs on the left words. Does the minus <laughs> sign not change? No, the minus sign, yeah. I, I, I thought, yeah. I was confused by this too, but the minus sign doesn't change. So because um, well, the minus sign doesn't change, OK, so the, here the minus sign changes, yeah. OK? Um, but here, so if, 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 we write, if we write the expansion of the metric in terms of the flat metric plus the h, that, that changes, right? But what we've done here now is we've looked at the transformation properties of the h. Yeah? So if, if we write um, so the, the transformation properties of the downstairs h, uh, you can just get from this equation by just uh, multiplying with, with two metrics, right, just to, to lower the index. And you'll get the same equation with the same minus signs. 
um, and th th the reason why that's confusing is because it flips here. But if you if you would write the the full metric downstairs, you would get an overall minus sign or then a plus sign because you have the overall sign here, right? So the entire sign in front of this entire object flips, but the relative sign here does not. Uh, well, because just if you contract, right? You have many mu's and mu's there. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, it's, so this is an eta mu nu, delta nu, right? So if I contract these. <sighs> crap. Yeah, wait, well it should. Because, uh, okay. I mean, from the trace, you should get something like del rho psi rho. Right. Yeah, yeah. So right, these should be the same, right? Okay. So let's do this. Let's let's do it slowly, because I mean, <coughs> so I can see what happened. I was thinking, ah, it's just a rotor. It's an obvious step. I can go fast, and then, okay. So we're taking del nu of this object. Okay. So we have an eta mu nu del nu del mu psi mu, right? Uh, ah, I should give it a different name. <laughs> Let's call it A. Um, okay? Now, this becomes a del mu, like this. And now, this is <laughs> still not the same as here. Yeah, it is, because sure, you've just switched the derivatives around. Okay, these are the, just switch to the derivatives, rename alpha and nu, and it's the same thing. Who can spot the next index missing, yeah? No, I just want to ask, uh, when you've written x prime mu equal to x mu plus c mu, uh, are you talking about translations, or are these just infinitesimal Lorentz? Yeah, general, general infinitesimal coordinate transformations. Can be anything. Okay, any more questions? Any more misplaced indices? Yes? So, uh, in this mechanism, when you write g mu nu is equal to eta mu nu plus h mu nu, uh, like on the third blackboard. Yeah. Uh, are you ignoring the cosmological constant for now? Yes. Yes. Correct. Correct. So I. It's all okay. So this is true in general, but if when I write as soon as I write the Minkowski metric here, I'm ignoring the the cosmic expansion. Yes. Thanks for mentioning that. So what you would do, and in in the in the very last lecture when we talk about cosmological sources, we can't do that anymore because then it becomes important. And then what you would do, you would here not use Minkowski metric, but you would use Friedman, Roberts, and Walker elementary metric. Yeah, so you do the same thing. You still have a background metric, but it becomes time dependent. But you can still look at small perturbations around this metric. Yes, thanks, thanks for asking. That's actually really important. But for most of the time, like if you're just looking for, so for example, if we, if we take LIGO's, what LIGO measured, right? I mean, what LIGO measured, um, was very, very far away, you know, on astronomical distances, but it was at a redshift of 0.1 or not even. Yeah, so from the point of view of, um, of the effects on the metric, uh, it's, it's, it's really small. So, yeah, uh, after... After this lecture, I think I hope that the goal of this lecture is to simplify everything so much that we don't won't need so many indices anymore, and then um, I'm going to have a lot an easier life. Okay, but so conclusion so far. Okay, so conclusion so far is we've imposed Lorentz gauge. Um, important equation, uh, and. In Lorentz gauge, we've seen that the entire left-hand side of the Einstein equation, so g mu nu, is just given by the box operator of h bar. And this equation I'm going to need, so we give it a name. 
Okay, but now we still need to deal with something. What we still need to deal with is that we still have we can still have transformations uh, with box xi equals zero, and these are still gauge uh, These are still only gauge degrees of freedom, right? So before identifying what is actually the gravitational wave, you need to take care of these. Hmm. Yes, I want to. Okay, so we can still, so we fixed, we've essentially fixed psi nu up to, we still have the, the freedom of transforming um, x nu oops, by some eta nu with box eta nu equals zero. Yeah, this is the same here that we still have, we can still have transformations, that is still a residual symmetry uh, that has box alpha equals zero. And but here, here that was one degree of freedom, right? Because alpha is just a scalar. Here it means four degrees of freedom. Um, and one way of, uh, one simple way of fixing these four degrees of freedom, so you need to fix them, um, you need to fix them in a consistent way, yeah, that is consistent with Einstein equations. And I will do this now uh, in the case that t mu nu equals zero. Yeah, so on the, if we're outside the source, so we just have a freely propagating gravitational wave. And in that case, there's a very simple choice uh, so you can fix one degree of freedom by setting the trace of h to zero, and you can fix another three degrees of freedom uh, by requiring that the zero i component of h is zero. Okay? And together, this fixes precisely the four degrees of freedom uh, that was still free here. And that in particular implies, because we still have Lorentz gauge, right? Lorentz gauge um, tells you that, um, let me write it properly here. So Lorentz gauge tells you, let me write it down here, that del nu h bar mu nu is zero. But that's, if we choose now here the, um, the zero index, because we can choose any index, that tells you that d0 h0 zero, zero minus del i h0 zero i uh, is zero, okay? So this, this condition uh, Yes, okay, right. So, okay, so this condition, ha, ah, now I've confused myself. So where I want to arrive, Sorry, I, I've confused. Okay, I, I'm okay. I, I look. I look up until next time how the argument goes. But okay, essentially, uh, what what this can okay. So you have you have a four by four matrix, right, for H, and this condition tells you that all these indices are zero. Uh, this condition tells you that you're traceless. Um, And now the argument that I'm not finding is why, the, or the, why also this condition, this guy here is zero. But okay, let me, I look it up for you for next time. I'm, it's something really simple, but I'm not seeing it right now. But okay, so these, to get back on track, so this way is an explicit way uh, of fixing the four residual degrees of freedom. 
it's possible only outside the source. Uh, inside the source, you also have to fix these uh, four degrees of freedom, but you have to do it in a slightly more complicated way. Uh, and this goes under the name of transverse traceless gauge, yeah? abbreviated as TT gauge. Uh, yeah, so the, the traceless part is clear. This is this. Uh, and the transverse part is the thing that I, that I was just struggling with. Uh, but the, you do also have this, this condition here. Does anybody see why? Is it possible that you're considering um, that the derivative of the perturbation of a metric with respect to time is much, much smaller than the derivative with respect to spatial dimension? That would, that would do the trick, but I don't think that, I, I think this is more general. I agree that that would do the trick because I mean, because the other term here, so for sure this guy plus this guy is zero, right? So once, once one knows that this guy is zero, one is done. Hmm. Okay. Does it run from zero? I mean, you run pi there? Yes, the thing is that once, once, so once one is in transverse traceless gauge, one only needs to consider the spatial components because everything else gets projected away. But I'm missing one step in my argument now. So, okay, so let's put this as magic for the moment, okay, and I'll, I'll look it up um, this evening. Or maybe it will come to me once, once we continue. Yeah. So you, you are imposing that a is zero, i equals to zero, and it's the divergence, it, it's not zero, so I don't understand that. This so one? Why, why did the third, you were, you were three, and then some equation. Why this equation does not imply that one? Yeah, why this equation does not imply what you need, what you did? Yeah. It does, right? Yeah. Is the limit of zero is zero? Ah, oh, no, sorry, because, okay, yeah, 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 no, so this, this is, this, sorry, this should be more general, so in, in transverse traceless gauge, uh, this in the end has to hold, right, because then, sorry, yeah, yeah, um, but in order to show that, I need, I need that the, that the zero, zero component vanishes, and I know it does, I just don't know why, but, okay, maybe let's not, um, yes. So the goal of this is to end up with one degree of freedom? So, now we do the counting, okay? Now we do the counting. Um, so we started with uh, h mu nu, okay? h mu nu ha is a symmetric four by four tensor and has 10 degrees of freedom. Four plus three plus two plus one. Then we impose Lorentz gauge, okay? So how do I write? Maybe plus. So we impose Lorentz gauge, which is del mu h bar mu nu is zero. If you do that, you were trying to do this with the, the new equal zero, but if you do it with new equal i, then you get like, the, the, the result that you want. So if I do, ah, yeah, the so if I do uh, del new h i new, ah, right. I think I like this. Well, minus del j h. Right. Okay. And now, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And this is zero, right? Uh, because of this condition, and then you directly get this condition. Thank you. So you impose right. So you impose. These are the things you impose by hand. You immediately see these are four equations. And then you just use Lorentz gauge, and you see that this imposes uh, this condition, which means uh, essentially, which is essentially what, okay, imagine, so the word transverse comes from, imagine you do a Fourier composition, and this becomes a k vector, right? This tells you that the, the scalar product of the h with the k is always zero, yeah? which means your perturbation is transverse to the direction of propagation. Uh, so this is why the name transverse traceless gauge comes from. 
the, haha, but tr look at this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so once you're in transfer traces gauge, good point, one, once you're in transfer traces gauge, the H and the H bar are the same object, right? So then you would not have to worry at all about it. The reason why we still go to the pain of introducing it is because you cannot do this gauge inside the source. Yeah, so the equations with the H bar are true in general, but in practice, you can nearly always forget about the H bar because we can work in tr transfer traces gauge. Okay, so the counting exercise. So we started here with 10. Uh, these are four equations. So minus four. Uh, and then here we had another four equations from the residual symmetry, okay? So in total, uh, we end up with two degrees of freedom, yeah, which is exactly the two polarizations uh, of a massless spin two particle, uh, which would be, if you manage to quantize gravity, which would be the graviton. Okay, so the um, yeah, so these are essentially the two massless degrees of freedom associated with a tensor object. And if we do the same exercise here, uh, this is the counting exercise we had this morning. So here we started with a mu, which had four degrees of freedom. Then we did Lorentz gauge. That was minus one. And here again, the residual minus one is also two. So that was the massless photon. And this is the, the massless uh, gravitational wave. So let me just, uh, yeah, so let me just to have it clear at the end. Um, so because now, okay, so we essentially already had the equation over there, but when we had derived the equation over there, there was still an issue, ah, we still have gauge degrees of freedom, what's with them? Yeah? So now we have an explicit way of fixing all the gauge degrees of freedom, and we can now write, uh, Einstein's equation in its final form for us. Okay, where if you're working in transfer stresses gauge, as we said, you can forget about the bar, but in general, uh, there's a bar. And what this tells you is that this is just a standard wave equation. Nothing else. So you have a wave equation. If you are outside the source, so if this guy is zero, you just have free wave, as you would expect. That's why it's called a gravitational wave. It is two degrees of freedom. Uh, and inside the source, you have a, a wave equation, which is a source term. So it's really, really a lot like what happens in, in uh, electrodynamics. Any more questions so far? So the, the, the traces, I think, will be um, fine. This is the problem. And because if you, because you have to obey this equation, right? Yeah. And if you simply set the zero i components uh, to zero on the left-hand side, well, it doesn't work if they're not zero on the right-hand side. I see. Yeah, so then you have to, you can work with, like, you have to use the Green's function. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do, you can do a, um, yeah, there, there, there's a, there, there is a consistent way to fix the gauge inside the source, and it also, I mean, it has to remove the same amount of degrees of freedom. It's just you can't, you can't go along and explicitly set things to zero, because then you look at this equation and you would see something is inconsistent. So, and in, in the same way, I mean, you can only essentially uh, make this object traceless if, you, if also the right-hand side is traceless, right? So it depends on your, in general, it depends on your source properties. So whatever, the gauge fixing condition will essentially contain information about what your source is. That's why it's more complicated 
uh, out inside the source. But also, I mean, nobody <coughs> forces us to fix the gauge, right? I mean, we like fixing the gauge because then, then instead of dealing with, with the 10 degrees of freedom, we only have two degrees of freedom. Um, but uh, there can also be situations where we're going to say, okay, we know we have a residual symmetry here. Well, I think we will essentially always impose Lorentz gauge because that's, that works in general and that simplifies things a lot. But in principle, um, and, and this, this here is true also if you just impose Lorentz gauge, you don't impose this. Um, so th there can be situations where you just say, okay, I can live with four residual degrees of freedom. I just need to keep track of them and I need to make sure that the things that I compute in the end are physical things and, and not gauge artifacts. Okay, so let's, um, so now we have our wave equation. Now what we want to do is we want to look at solutions to this wave equation. And in particular, we want to start by looking at solutions where the right hand side here is zero. Okay, so tomorrow we will look at stuff where the right hand side is non zero. For now, uh, this is zero, so it's really just a freely propagating wave. So we know how to deal with freely propagating waves. We can just make an ansatz that there's some, well, essentially Fourier coefficient. And then our wave equation will just take down two derivatives of k. And if the source is zero, <coughs> so two mu nu is zero, this is just zero. Okay? And this is of course nothing than e squared minus p squared. Uh, so this is telling us, uh, well, because this is zero, this is zero. So this is telling us we have a, gra we have a gravitational wave, because this is a wave equation, uh, and it's traveling with the speed of light. Um, OK, now we can go uh, to transverse traceless gauge, which means we only uh, need to bother here about the ij components. Yeah, we, we can drop the, the zero component. Uh, and in particular, we will consider a k vector uh, which is along the z axis, okay, just for simplicity. Um, and then, this is what I was saying before this uh, transverse traceless condition, uh, now read completely explicitly just brings down one power of k. Okay, so this is zero, so if you take, um, yeah, if you take this, for example, what it, this is, would now be the three direction. Yeah, this really just tells you that the gravitational wave lives completely in the space orthogonal to the direction, right? So if you have, so we now only have three indices left, uh, if we're propagating in the x direction, it means this is all zero. And our gravitational wave only lives in these four components. And moreover, uh, because H is symmetric and it is traceless, these four components are actually only two independent components. Okay, This component has to be, so if this is A11, one, one, then this has to be minus A11 in order to make it symmetric. And here we have, uh, in order, sorry, in order to make it traceless, and here we have the same component. So this is one, two. 
um, in order to make it symmetric. Yeah, so this is, we saw in general here just from counting degrees of freedom that we can only have two degrees of freedom. And now we see just by writing it completely explicitly, yes, these are the two degrees of freedom. The H00 is also zero, right? The H00 is also zero, yeah. So, um, yeah, so to see, okay, so now the question is what happens, what happens if such a gravitational wave uh, passes through space, yeah, passes through some room? And in order to do that, what we need to understand is we need to understand, okay, we have some two test masses, and we have some gravitational wave coming. And we need to understand how these test masses react to this gravitational wave. So for that, um, for that we need to deal one more last time with indices. So the geodesic equation yeah, which just describes uh, free falling test masses d square x mu over d tau plus gamma <coughs> mu nu rho of x dx nu d tau dx rho d tau equals zero. Okay, so this is another one of these like fundamental GR equations, which I assume either you, you've seen it before or you, or you believe me. Um, but it just tells you like how you have a, you have a, a space time which is curved by, uh, by the metric encoded in a Christoffel symbol, and this just describes how particles uh, just freely move without any other external force. Okay, but now we don't, we don't really care about what a single particle does, we want to know what a pair of particles does. Okay, because we want to, the effect of the gravitational wave will be how does this particle move with respect to that particle. So what we need is the geodesic deviation equation. So we introduce a second, so we had one particle at the, some location x, right, and now we have a second particle at x mu plus xi mu. But uh, xi is now again a small parameter, but it's not a gauge transformation, okay? It's just this here is xi. And then you write, you write the same equation now for x plus xi, and then you take the difference, uh, and you get an equation of motion for xi. Where, yeah, these are all evaluated at x. Zero. Okay. And now, uh, the first, because now, okay, now what we're going to use is Okay, so these, we're going to assume that these test masses uh, move in a non-relativistic manner. So we're going to say that dxi over d tau is much smaller than dx0 over d tau. Um, and we're also going to assume that at, we're, go we're going to choose a, a, a coordinate transformation such that at because this, this was x, right? This was x plus xi. And we're going to pick our, uh, our gauge transformation such that around the point x, the, Christ the Christoffel symbol uh, is zero, right? So we're going to impose that g mu nu rho at the point x 
is zero. Yeah, you can always choose a transformation to impose that at a single point. Okay, you cannot do this globally, of course. Yes, yes, so now, right, so now we're not, but here we're not talking about gravitational waves yet. Yeah, this is just uh, geodesic equations. But you're exactly right, this, this choice, this choice is actually a different gauge choice than the one we had before. Yeah, this gauge choice also has a name, it's called the, um, the proper detector frame. And this is the frame that essentially experimentalists like working in, right? So they assume I have my detector, and the, the, the space around my detector um, is, is flat, at least in, in cl close proximity to my test mass. And, that in, in, and once you choose this frame, you can no longer impose transverse traceless gauge. Yeah, so one, one has to, yes. It's a, it's a subtle but important point. OK. Um, so once you impose these two conditions, this simplifies a lot. You, all that's left is uh, d xi d tau squared plus xi sigma del sigma gamma i zero zero del x zero over del tau squared. Yeah. So tau tau is just uh, time here. Uh, and so note that we set this zero, but only at one point, right? So that means that the derivative of it is not zero, yeah, because it was only zero at a single point. And now, and this addresses a bit your comment, um, you can rewrite Right, you can rewrite this object as one component of the Riemann tensor. And the reason for doing that is that this object is now a gauge invariant object, right? So we got here cho choosing a specific gauge, but now that we're here, and we know it's gauge invariant, we can compute this in whatever gauge we like. Yeah? And in particular, you could compute it in transverse traceless gauge using just the explicit formulas that we had on the, on the board beforehand. And what you will find is that this is minus 1 over 2 c squared h dot ajpt. Okay, and this is now where the gravitational wave enters because now we have explicitly said um, what our metric actually looks like. So, long story short, at the end of the day we get what is called the geodesic deviation equation. Yes. Okay, which just tells us uh, that the, the distance, the second derivative of the distance between the two test masses is given by the second derivative uh, of the gravitational wave. Okay, that's, that's essentially where we wanted to get uh, uh, with all this. Yeah, so with that, we're nearly where I wanted to get. Yes. Uh, so you, you're right that if you, if, um, I mean, you, you're right about the detector. Um, I'm not, okay, so, so I think there's, there's, there's two parts of the answer. So one thing is, yes, you're right about the detector, um, but we don't quite see that yet here, I think. I think we'll see that later. Um, well, yeah, we'll see that when we solve the equation explicitly. Um, here it is true we have we have assumed psi to be small. Yeah, because but we don't know about the relation to the 
we yeah we haven't we right we haven't set it specifically to be small with respect to the the wavelength but we have we have set it to be small because at some point i think here here you you we only went to linear order in xi yeah because here you would also have in principle xi squared terms and we neglected those yeah so we have we have assumed that xi is a, is a is a small parameter but if you want you could like imagine you know you can imagine kind of like if you say you have two test masses far away, you imagine kind of maybe a chain of test masses from one to the other, and you always kind of look at the effect of our neighboring objects, and then you still get an effect feeling of what the gravitational wave does in, does in total. At some point it averages out, right? At some point, in, yeah. So th this, is, this is the point, but I don't think we, we see that yet because we don't have, the, we don't have the, the really the detector arm in here yet, right? But it's true that, of course, if you, um, if you have a very long detector arm, well, we'll see in a minute how, how it reacts, and then I'll answer your question, right? Yeah. So, up until here, we were in the proper detector frame, right? Uh, and then here we switched, and, and even, even this line was still in the proper detector frame. Then we realized that we can write this equation in a gauge invariant way. Yeah, and then we can switch to whatever frame we want. Um, and then we actually computed, so this, this relation is true in transverse traceless gauge. Yeah, so this final uh, thing is also true in transverse traceless gauge. But this was in the proper detector frame. It's a bit fishy. I, I, I agree. Um, but you didn't have to impose this to derive this uh, simplified version. You Here? To derive this, you didn't have to impose the, that the simple symbol Spanish, did you? Yeah, but then she, she, she cannot, uh, she I did, right? Because I, I had to impose it here to get rid of this term. Yeah, but, but then, uh, then you say, okay, I derived an equation by using the gauge, somehow fixing it, and then you say again, okay, but I switch it. No, so I just switch it. Okay, so this is, okay. May I, I remove it here? So this equation is in a proper detector frame, right? This equation is still in a proper detector frame. This equation, let me phrase it this way. This equation has an element inside it, right? Which is gauge invariant. Because it's, it's just uh, the Riemann tensor. And this element I can now compute, because it's gauge invariant, I can compute this element in whatever gauge I wish to compute it. And I wish to compute it for simplicity in, in transverse traceless gauge. You could, of course, also compute it in a I mean, it would maybe be more, more logical, but technically more difficult, but more logical to compute it in a proper detector frame, right? We just choose to compute it in this gauge because it has a nice simple expression in, in this gauge. So, okay, but the equation holds like an The equation holds, yeah. Okay. But I'll, um, yeah, th there's a little subtlety there. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll leave this on the board and I'll come back. That there's a fun fact about that equation. Um, which can be very confusing. But let's first finish the, the main line of thought, because we're nearly there. So, we have, ah, yes, here, it is here. So there's two degrees of freedom, right? One is the diagonal and one is the off-diagonal. So let's consider what happens to a gravitational wave um, which is, so say we have a gravitational wave, which is only on the diagonal, okay? And now I'm, I'm only looking, I'm dropping all the, all the zeros on the outside. So that's the gravitational wave that I want to look at. Um, now I'm interested in the, in the displacement, okay? So the displacement, okay, there will be some absolute position, which I don't care and some delta x, which is time dependent, and the same in the y direction. And now, we use this equation. Uh, 
and you find, or you just, just insert, right? Um, you see that delta x double prime is minus axx over 2 x0 plus delta x and now we take the second derivative so we get omega squared sine omega t and again because the delta x for sure will be small so very roughly uh, we can we can neglect this okay and the same we do for the y component Same result, y0 now of course, omega sine omega t. Now you can solve these equations, right? So you just get, will I fit it here? Yes, so delta x of t uh, is then of course just axx over 2x0 sine omega t and the same for y with a minus sign y0 sine omega t okay why do we do that now imagine we have a coordinate system and we don't only have two test masses but let's say we have a ring of test masses okay um, this is going to no. This is going to be a disaster. I need more room. But I want to. Um, okay, we can get rid of this. Okay. So imagine we have test masses sitting on a circle. This is our original circle. And now we look at these equations, right? So if you're, uh, and let's, let's say we pick the phase such that when we start out, the sign is positive, okay? So that means if you have a positive x0, uh, you increase. If you have, like, if you're positive x0, your delta x is positive. Uh, if you have a negative x0, your delta x is negative, right? So this guy, whoops, I should not changing x and y, this guy will move to the right, this guy will move to the left. On the other hand, for y, we have this minus sign here, okay? which means if your y0 is positive, your delta y will actually be negative. Yeah? So it means this guy moves down, and this guy moves up. So this circle is deformed into an ellipse, which roughly looks like this. Okay? And then, of course, once you continue to oscillate and the sinus flips sine, you get the opposite direction. So this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, and you get an ellipse like this. And this is why, so this kind of looks like a cross, right? And this is why we call this type of a polarization the plus, the plus polarization. And we can do the exact same thing with the other polarization, right? So we can do also the cross. So we can, H cross is just defined with the off diagonals. And you go through the exact same exercise. Uh, and you get what you get. So here we had that X is proportional to X zero and Y to Y zero. For the cross polarization, you will find that this is flipped. Right, so what happens if you start with a with a circle like this? You'll find that you also get ellipses, but they are oscillating in this way. Okay, and this is what is the the uh, cross polarization. Yeah, and what this means, and essentially, essentially, always from now, uh, we will not worry about like all these indexes that were on the H, but the H will simply get one index call it lambda or something for helicity, uh, and the lambda will be either plus or cross. Yeah, and then you can also, you can take linear combinations, so plus, plus minus i cross, for example, will give you left and right chiral waves, so it's a chiral basis. But here, 
here is I just wanted to once ex very explicitly show you where, why these indices always arise and how the two degrees of the gravitational wave actually look. Right? So here we have a, yeah, I mean the gravitational wave here is coming at us, right? And then what it does, it deforms the space transfers to its direction, but it deforms it in the kind of not, not completely trivial way. Yeah, it's not like a, like a photon which just like oscillates in one direction because, well, it's a spin-2 object. Yeah, so this is, this is what it actually does to space. Um, so, a fun fact about this equation. Um, if you compute, so remember we got, we got to here using the proper detector frame. If you would now forget about that, yeah, because you, you, you were sloppy, and you would try to compute this guy, in trans the, the Christoffel symbol here, in transverse traceless gauge, it's zero. Yeah. Um, and what that essentially tells you, okay, so A, it tells you you've been sloppy, you're mixing different gauges, yeah? But what, what it also indicates is, 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 is a deeper reason here, right? And that is, um, in the proper detector frame, let me see if I get this right. Yes. So in the well, let's me, okay in the transverse traceless gauge, your test masses are essentially free falling test masses, yeah. And then once you have a gravitational wave, what really actually happens um, is that the it's not the um, the coordinate which change; it's the proper distance between the two that changes. Okay. Maybe more. Okay. So in the proper detector frame, in the proper detector frame, you fix your test masses are some fixed points, right? And that, that's, that's essentially your coordinates, right? Now when a gravitational wave passes in a proper detector frame, it's really th that your test masses are moving. This is essentially, this is a little bit the picture that we have here. Yeah? This is kind of what, how experimentalists think about this. You have a gravitational wave passing and it actually physically moves your object. Now in transverse traceless gauge, we've by definition put ourselves in a gauge where the test masses are free falling. And the coordinate system is just a free-falling coordinate system. Okay, so by definition, nothing is moving, right? Because by definition, everything is free-falling. How can it move, right? So the coordinate system and the coordinates of these points don't move. And this is why this Christoffel symbol vanishes. But if you compute the proper distance, so for example, the, light, the, the time it takes for light to propagate from one test mass to the other, then that propagating light will notice that the metric in between is different, it's curved by the gravitational wave, and hence the re result will be dif different. Right? So in both, cases, in both cases, you will find that light going from test mass 1 to test mass 2 now takes longer or shorter, but once it's because the test masses are now further apart, and the other time it is because light had to take a longer way in between because the metric uh, was curved. Okay? So in the end, you get the same result in both frames, but it's a little bit confusing. And if you mix frames, it is very dangerous, right? So it's, it, I'm glad that you asked that question. And also, I mean, for a long time, people were actually confused if gravitational waves are real or if they're a gauge artifact, right? For, for precisely these this types of, of confusions. I mean, I think the very last people were really only convinced uh, w once we saw them, yeah, because, because there are some subtleties here. Um, and there is gauged freedom, which one has to, has to trace through very carefully. Okay, and now to answer uh, your question about the, about the detector. So now, now we essentially know how the gravitational waves act on the detector, right? So um, if we stay in the proper detector frame, which is, so the, the transverse traceless frame is easier to do the computations. The proper detector frame is usually easier to think, yeah, because you could just imagine the test mass is moving, right? So, um, well, you have a detector arm with two, with two test masses, right? And now they are, you have a gravitational wave. If the gravitational wave is very long, yeah, like this, okay, then it just moves. Well, I need to draw three dimensional, right? We want the gravitational wave going in this direction so that it moves the test mass in that direction, right? But if it has such a wavelength, it will just move this by, by something, and that's exactly what we measure. Now, if the gravitational wave is, is oscillate much faster, then essentially what happens, let me draw this more carefully. Oh, this was a bad example. Like do it like this. That all all the full oscillations do absolutely nothing. Yeah, because it just moves the, the test mass back and forth. But it's only in this case would only be the last the last part of an oscillation uh, which matters. Right? So you can still detect it. 
You can still see it, but you've wasted all this part of your arm. Okay, so your sensitivity dramatically decreases, but you can, in principle, you can still see them. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Ah, the omega is the k. Yeah, so, uh, right, I should say that omega, omega is k. So we had, uh, before we had the I e to the ikx, right, and I assumed speed of light. So the, the omega is just the absolute value of k. Um, yeah, and I just, I just looked at the real part because that's easier to draw. Thanks. Yeah. Next lecture. Spoiler. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. So um, actually, yeah, absolutely. Because so far, we've, we Einstein equation, right? We have g mu on the left and t mu on the right, right? And so far, we said, OK, um, t mu is only a math thing, and, and g mu is only a, a metric thing. And we computed now gravitational waves, right? Uh, and we implicitly assumed, very silently, we implicitly assumed that the gravitational wave itself does not back react on the metric, yeah, so that it does not curve the metric itself. Um, yeah, we assumed we assumed a flat metric, right? If if the we assumed eta mu nu Minkowski metric. If the gravitational wave itself carries energy momentum tensor, you would expect it would curve the background metric, but then we can't just assume Minkowski metric. But isn't the h mu nu the curvature in space time because of these gravitational waves? Say again. The, so the h menu, yes. So the h menu is the gravitational wave, right? But we've we've expanded. We wrote uh, we wrote g mu nu is eta mu nu plus h mu nu, right? So we assumed we assumed from the start that it makes sense to write and and this guy was time independent and this guy was time dependent, right? That was the way we worked, right? And then we said, okay, this is Minkowski. Well. Friedman, uh, Robertson, Walker, right? But the problem is now, uh, and we, we'll talk about that, and the, the, uh, most of the next lecture will actually be about that, right? These guys carry energy. Yeah, if these guys source an energy momentum tensor, they will back react on a metric, and a metric might not look like this. It might look different, right? And it may be that this way of writing it is actually not entirely consistent. So. The short answer to your question is, yes, these guys can carry energy momentum tensor, uh, and it is important. And we'll come back to it uh, tomorrow. But aren't we also considering that to first order, they have a larger effect in changing the curvature of space-time rather than carrying energy momentum? Because we don't have any correction on the right-hand side, but we do have a correction on the left-hand side. We do have a correction on the right-hand side. We just uh, have ignored it so far. Yeah, precisely. Any more questions? OK, I think we're perfectly on time. Have a coffee.